Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. I hope this finds you well and that you're staying in the Word of God every day. You start your day with the Word of God, you end your day with the Word of God. And when I say Word of God, I can say it singular because I have the perfect written Word of God in my hands. And if you have a King James Bible, you have the perfect written Word of God in your hands. The Word says, the Holy Scripture says, when we say the Bible, we're talking about singular. This Bible right here, that's a library of books, the King James Bible. God's perfect written word. Are you starting your day with it? Are you ending your day with it? The Bible says pray without ceasing. Are you praying? Brothers and sisters of Christ, not, not many of you guys are making comments that much anymore in the comment section. Let me know how you're doing. I've always pray, I pray to the Lord all the time and say, Lord, how are the brothers and sisters in Christ doing? Let me know how you're doing. You guys get to know how I'm doing through these videos, but you don't, you know, every once in a while I do a walk and talk and show you how the property's doing, or I let you know how I'm doing, brothers and sisters Christ, but I really don't get to hear from you that much anymore. Everyone seems to be, you know, being quiet, you know. So we're going to get into this study. It's going to be a little bit of a longer one. It was supposed to be a two-part study, okay? Acknowledge Him in all thy ways, Aaron. There's two areas in, in the Bible that I believe, and there's probably more, but for these series, series of studies, God put it in my heart to talk about two instances where Aaron really failed the Lord. Okay? Where he really didn't follow Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 which we're going to be going through. And I got to do in this study, and as normal, and you guys, if you know this, me in ministry, I love the Word of God. I love Bible studies. I love going Scripture with Scripture with Scripture and jumping all over the place, comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture as long as they line up. I'm just not, you know, going all over the place, and you're like, by the time he's done, one minute he's talking about an apple, not an apple, a fruit in a garden, and the next minute he's talking about, you know, a horse and this and the next thing he's talking about over here is I'm not talking about that I'm just saying I, I believe that we're supposed to labor in the word those who are doing Bible teaching and we're supposed to follow 2nd Timothy 2 15 we're supposed to rightly divide we're to compare scripture with scripture and we're supposed to follow you know the dispensations and understand what's written to us and what's written for us okay getting a little ahead of myself but prob uh, you go ahead and turn to Exodus 32 Exodus 32 is where we're going to be today Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. How do you trust the Lord with all your heart? Thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. You take God's word and you hide it in your heart and you trust God. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's saying. He's right. We're wrong. The world's wrong. And lean not on thine own understanding. What gets in the way? The body of flesh. This gets in the way. Our own understanding. Man's wisdom, world's wisdom. Have God not made, hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? The three enemies: the flesh gets in the way and tries to get use, get you to use your own understanding. The world tries to get in the way and tries to get you to use the world's wisdom, and the world's understanding. And then Satan gets in the way, and his ministers. Remember that his ministers. I I was talking to someone at the farmers market. And she brought this up, and I told her that ministers, Satan's ministers, aren't these people like Anton LaVey, the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey, where they're goth, they got piercings, tattoos, they're out in cemeteries doing animal sacrifices and stuff like that, and, and they're drawing pentagram stars on the, on the ground with candles. Those aren't true Satanists. A true Satanist is going to try to look and act like someone who's like one of us, brother says Christ, like a like the body of Christ, a bride of Christ. He's gonna do everything they can to infiltrate the body of Christ. They're gonna be clean shaven. They're gonna be wearing a nice suit and tie. They're gonna be in the Babel building system, organized religion. That's where the true Satanists are. Okay? You have those three things. And brother says Christ. A prayer request was answered. I was praying for the last three weeks. Praying, praying, praying. And thank you, Lord, for reminding me. We're pr praying, praying, praying that, Lord, God would open up a door for me to hand out my gospel tracts that God blessed me with. I fold them up into a square, and I go hand them out. Okay. I, ever since I have Declan, and he's right over there, sitting there looking at me. Ever since I have Declan, he's not like Victoria used to be. Okay. Victoria used to be very docile, very calm, very quiet, very meek. 
and she would just follow me around everywhere I went and I could hand out gospel tracts to people on the beaches and everything. But with Declan, a lot of the, the people I keep coming across have dogs and Declan's not that friendly with other dogs yet. He's getting there, but he's not as friendly with other dogs. And he's a little rambunctious. He's also still a little scared of people and he's learning to be a little bit more friendlier. But he, he's, he, when I got him, he was scared of everything. Okay. So I'm working with him. So that kind of hindered my giving out gospel tracts on the beaches when I walked Declan on the beaches. So then I started praying, Lord, open, you know, open doors for me to preach, uh, to, to give the gospel out and to preach the gospel and everything. And I was at the farmer's market and God opened a door. I was able to give that woman a gospel tract. We sat there for about 20, 30 minutes talking about the, I normally buy some food from her. And I got to talk to her about the gospel. I got to talk to her about the Bible version issue. I got to talk, and that's what, you know, brought, I talked to her about how you be careful about just because someone claims to be a Christian, to be of God, doesn't mean they're of God. And we, I quote a scripture to her. Okay? But lean not on thine own understanding. Make sure, brothers and Christ, hopefully you're out there giving out, lay, at least laying gospel. I still lay gospel tracts everywhere. I go, I try to lay gospel tracts. Okay? Make sure you're gospel tracting, brothers and sisters in Christ. You're not out there on that, you don't have to be out there on that street corner with a sign hollering at the top of your lungs. You can still be a living witness and a verbal witness and lay gospel tracts places. Okay? And lean not on thine own understanding. Those, remember those three enemies, they try to get in the way of you trusting the Lord with all your heart, and they'll start messing you up. And all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Remember we looked this up, I, I'm going to do this in every one, because we need to get this in our hearts. Acknowledge, Webster's 1820 Dictionary, to own or notice with particular regard. In other words, to make the Lord and his way the foundation of all your ways. Acknowledge him in all thy ways. Every step you take, do you take a second to say, Lord, is this the right thing? Is this okay? People say, oh, come on, come on. If I go to mow the lawn, how many of you, brothers of Christ, mainly brethren, they're out there, okay, I'm getting ready to mow the lawn. You just jump right into mowing the lawn and you mow the lawn. How many of you take a second, just a few seconds to say, hey, Lord, is it, can you bless this? This is what I like to do. I always tell you, brothers, I always ask the Lord, Lord, if it be thy will, I'd like to mow the lawn today. Lord, will you bless this? The works of my hand. Make sure the lawnmower doesn't break down. Make sure I don't have any problems. If it be your will, Lord, I like to mow the lawn. Today I've got four things I, got, I like to do today. I've got to dig a hole on the side of the house and put the bucket back into the hole. There's this huge bucket that I'm using. It's like a garden bucket. And then I'm going to fill it with sand, and it's where the chickens are going to go use it for dust baths. So that's one thing I'd like to get done today. I've got to replace all the... Um, I don't want to call it the, the liquid, like the nectar that you make, the, the sugar water for the hummingbirds. I have to do laundry today. I've started it. Um, and there was a fourth thing. I'll figure it, I'll remember it later. But there was four things I wanted to do, and I talked with the Lord last night and said, I want to do this tomorrow. If it be thy will, Lord, can I get these things done and can I be blessed? This study, I thought was the fourth thing. This study was the fourth thing. I'd like to get this stuff done tomorrow if it be your will. Are you, in every step that you take, do you make God part of it? I'm going to cook breakfast, Lord. Will you please bless this? You know, help me, Lord, with this. Is this okay, Lord? Something tells me something's not right. Can you show me what's wrong here? You seek the Lord in all your ways. You acknowledge Him in all your ways. Okay. Romans 3, 4 says, God forbid, yet let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, thou art that thou mightst be justified in thy sayings and mightst overcome when thou art judged. Let God be true, but every man a liar. This flesh will lie to you and deceive you, try to talk you out of this. The world will lie to you and deceive you and try to talk you out of this. Talk you out of seeking God and acknowledging. And that's what this whole series of studies is about. Psalms 33, 11 says, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. I want my, his heart to be on my heart. That word that hid in my heart. So what gets in the way of acknowledging the Lord in all your ways? We'll be continuing a series of studies showing great men in the Bible and where they failed to trust the Lord and acknowledge the Lord in all their ways. And what got in the way of doing it? This is for instruction in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, 
All scripture is given by inspiration is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We're going on for instruction in righteousness. In Romans 15, 4 it says, For whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comforts of the scriptures might have hope. Remember, we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope with the life that we live. And we take this, hide it in our heart, and that's how we look for that blessed hope with the life that we live. Things before time were written for our learning. This is for our learning. Okay? So turn to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. We're going to get into Aaron. Remember, you can always pause the video and turn to the scriptures. If it seems like I'm going so fast, pause the video and turn to the scriptures. One thing I was just talking with the Lord before I turned on the camera, I said, if I ever was blessed, because I always pray for it, that I could have a physical flock, you know, brethren face to face, physically here to preach to, I'd have to slow down a little bit. And I would have to give them time to turn. And there is no, oh, I made a huge mistake, let's, let's try to start the video over it. No, 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 this, you got to go through it. you got to go through your mistakes and owe up to your mistakes. And oftentimes I do. There's very few times that I'll stop the video because I screwed up or lost my train of thought and I was going the wrong direction. And the Lord has been working on me to stay focused on the teaching at hand, stay focused. Because I hit verses that have two or three things you can learn from it, and I'm trying to push one thing, and I start going off on these other two, and the Lord's like, it raised me back in. You're mainly trying to make this point here. You can do another study later using the same verse again to talk about these other things. So, uh, you can always pause the video and turn. Okay? Turn to Exodus 32.1. Why you're going to 32.1? In Exodus 24.14 we read, And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man have any matter to do, let him come unto them. I had to highlight him. Him is singular. Let him come unto them. In other words, small matters, take it to Aaron or her. They'll take care of it. We'll be back. All right. Him is singular. Aaron and her can take care of small problems one-on-one. -on -one. But what happened in Exodus 32? And that's where we're going to get. All right. Exodus 32, 1, we read, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron. The people. It's a big group. Um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to add to the word of God, but what if it's a mob? It's a huge group. We know it's a lot of people. We'll get to that. It's almost like a mob. It's not one-on-one. -on -one. Bring, bring him, that man, to Aaron and, uh, he'll, and her, and they'll take care of it. But you see, the people gather themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, lowercase g gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we what not what this is, we what not what is become of him. Now I want to stop here and make a few points. Okay. One that's not even on my list that God just put on my heart. Make us gods, plural. Do you realize that even when they try to act like there's one God, when you actually look into a lot of these organized religions and false religions, they have gods, plural. People always get on to me about the Trinity. The Trinity, oh, the Trinity preaches false, lowercase g, gods, plural. And then they try to hide it by saying, but we believe in one God. No, you don't. No, you don't. All these false religions, false gods, false gods. It's God's plural that they believe in. Okay? It always comes down to it. We're following one, the one true God, and somehow the, Satan always tries to get them off to God's plural. Okay? The Trinity, one plus one plus one equals one. No, it doesn't. One plus one plus one equals three. You're worshiping three gods. I worship one God, God the Father, through, through His Son, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, there's but one God the Father. So once again, we see this, that when people fall to the right, to the left, and they don't stay true to this right here, what happens? They start getting idolatry. They start having idols in their life. They start having false gods. That's what idols are. They're false, lowercase g, gods in their life. Okay? 
That's a small thing. Uh, it's, it's a big thing, but for this study, it's, it's, I don't want to go off on too much in too, the wrong direction. But point one I want to make. Now, why did they choose Aaron over her? Remember we read in Exodus 24, and then Moses is going up on the mount, and he's gone for 40 days, and God's talked to him. You're going through the scriptures, and there's chapters where God's talking to Moses and talking to Moses. And then it comes back and shows what's going on down here with 32. What's going on down at the bottom of the mount, and you got to hear what Moses was doing up at the top of the mount. But why did they choose Aaron over her? You don't have to turn here, but 2 Timothy 4.1 says, I charge thee therefore before God. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. I threw that in there because it's important, because then it leads to what we're going to be talking about in verse 3. That's how a preacher is supposed to be. When God put elevates someone to be in like a shepherd, or someone who be an ordained elder, a bishop, or a deacon, someone who's got the gift of being a preacher or a teacher, that's how they're supposed to be. Verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. They're going to go to people that they think they can manipulate. They're going to go to people that they think that they can get them to tell them, that tell them what they want to hear. Here's the truth. I don't want that. But this guy over here will tell me what I want to hear. Well, this guy over here, he, her, he's going to stand for the truth. But this Aaron guy, maybe we can get him to do what we want, us, want him to do. We can work with this guy. You say you're trying to put an Aaron down. Oh, let's go into this. Uh, verse 5. But watch thou in all things, in all things, endure affliction, do the work of evangelists, make full proof of thy ministry. But you've got people, my first point I'd make up is why didn't they go to her? They went to Aaron, but they didn't go to her. Why is that? Well, we're going to see why that was. Okay. Now, I know lost people and I know children. Brothers, this is Christ. A lot of you not, are starting to, if you've been saved for a while, you understand lost people when it comes to God and what truth is. And you understand it's just like children. If you know mom will say no, then we're going to go ask dad. If you know dad will say no, we're going to go ask mom. If you know one preacher will not tell you what you want to hear, well, I'm going to go find another one that I want to hear. I talk with brethren a lot. The reason I'm, just so you understand, Brother Christ, I love you, and I'm using YouTube to put out the Word of God to do the work I can. I'd rather have a house church face-to-face, -face, but I'm really not liking the Internet in these last days because there's no difference between an Internet Christian these days and what we used to call the Babel-building Christian. Just, you're a Christian on Sunday. You're just a Christian on Wednesday. You're only a Christian when you're on here. And when you get kicked out of one fellowship for your sins, lust of the flesh... Doctrines of uh, uh, worldliness, idolatry, putting the world first and not the Word of God, doing things the world's way instead of God's way, doctrines of devils. You just get kicked out of one group, you go to another group. You go find another group that's okay with what you want, that's okay with what you're teaching and preaching. In the old days, there was one body of Christ in the city, and if you got kicked out, you got kicked out. When Paul talks about fellowship, when you kick them out of your fellowship, they're out. They have to get their heart right with God so they can come back into the fellowship. There is no bouncing from group to group to group to group to group. There isn't. But today, there's a million groups to jump to. Every man's a one-man show on YouTube. You say, what about you, Philip Newton? I don't want to be a one-man show. I'm not full-time ministry. I'm just a, a Bible teacher. The Lord blessed me with putting out some Bible studies. I don't want to be a one-man show. But you've got a lot of people on here that want to be one-man shows. And if you don't like what one person says, you just hop to another. There's no consequences. If you get kicked out of the fellowship, there's no, you, there's no consequences. There's no loss. There's no conviction to get your heart right with the Lord so you can come back into the fellowship. You just find another fellowship. And bounce from fellowship, fellowship, and that's what people do. So if one preacher will not tell them what they want to hear, they'll go find another preacher. Why did they go to Aaron over her? 
right? Point two, this is just a, a small point, was Aaron a mason slash goldsmith before the Levitical priesthood was set up? Because they're asking him to make us gods. Make sure I read that right. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come out of the mountain, the people gathered themselves together and said to us, Up, make us gods. They're telling Aaron to make us gods. Was one of Aaron's jobs making uh, gold statues and metal statues, like metallurgy, when he was in Egypt? First time Aaron is mentioned with, with the priest office is Exodus 28.1, where it says, and take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. I thank the Lord <laughs> when it comes to names. I, hopefully I didn't do too bad, but it sounded really good. But Aaron's sons, usually I butcher names. But for Aaron's sons, this is the first time Aaron's mentioned the priest office. First time Aaron's mentioned in the Bible, Exodus 4, 14, it says, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, I, is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his, in his heart. I've seen cartoons. I'm, I'm warning you again, brothers of Christ, stay away from anything video-wise when it comes to cartoons and Hollywood movies on Bible stories, they always screw things up. And the cartoons, they always show Aaron, he's, he's moshing in the pit, making bricks with straw and everything, and he throws mud at Aaron, or Aaron's throwing mud at Moses, and instead of Aaron going in and talking to, uh, with Moses, Moses' wife goes in with them. His wife went back to Egypt. His wife wasn't actually in I I Egypt, I mean Egypt, went back to um, where they were, I forgot the name of the place, where Moses fled, he got his wife from the priest, uh, priest of Median. He had his wife there. She followed him away. So you have the story about you know the circumcision, and the and the wife not wanting to do it, but Mo, God's going to kill Moses because Moses is starting to side with his wife instead of circumcising the child. And the wife finally circumcises him, throws throws the foreskin before him. Yeah, bloody husband art thou to me. And you you don't know anything until you read later on that when they returned all of all the people come out of Egypt, that she is there in Median, waiting for Moses, and it says he had sent her back. So at some point, when before he reaches Egypt with Aaron, he sends her back. But they, the, the blasphemy of the movie, they have her and Aaron, uh, Moses going in, and Aaron's sitting there, moshing, he's a brick maker. No, he isn't. We see right here, as we can continue, that he works with metals. He's, he's, a, he's a metal worker. He's almost like a blacksmith. Hey, cartoons always show Aaron making bricks and whatnot. The movies and cartoons based on stories in the Bible can never get it right. I, if you spend more time in this book, listening to Alexander Scorby like I do, read the book, read it for yourself, and you spend more time in the stories of this book, you'll look on here and say, that's all satanic garbage. It's blasphemy. They get a few things right, but the things they get wrong is blasphemy. Uh, Daniel, just going off on a little bit of a tangent, uh, the, the Book of Daniel movie, I was watching that, and I wanted to do a correction on it, but I'm not good with the windows and moving stuff around. I used to, but I haven't done it in a while. But that Daniel movie, you have Daniel sitting there interpreting the dream to Nebuchadnezzar about the statue, and the head of gold is, is Nebuchadnezzar, it is. But people miss this. He sits there and looks at Nebuchadnezzar and says, Thou, Nebuchadnezzar, art king of kings. Thou art the head of gold. He just gave Nebuchadnezzar a title for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that's written on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. And when you read the story of Daniel, Daniel never tells him he's king of kings. He says, Thou the head of gold, thou art the head of gold, king. Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar. They took a title from God and gave it to Nebuchadnezzar. What is Nebuchadnezzar? He's a type of Antichrist. Then you get to where, uh, I always get it wrong. These names I always get wrong. Uh, Abednego, uh, Meshach, uh, probably Nebuchadnezzar, but the three Jews that were with Daniel, 
that they went through the fiery furnace. And when, they, when Nebuchadnezzar sees the fourth one, he sits there, the Bible says, the fourth one is likened to the Son of God, capital S, Son of God. That's the King James Bible. Capital S, Son of God. But in the movie, he sits there and goes, the fourth one's like an angel of God. People say, well, did you say in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, an angel of the Lord, that man, captive of the host of heaven, is a reference to uh, God manifest in the flesh in the Old Testament. Yes, but when it says Son of God, that's definitive. There's no arguing it. Because angels can mean the sons of God, plural, the angels that are in heaven. Or the angel of the Lord can be referring to Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. But when it says capital S, Son of God, there's no questioning it. That's Jesus Christ. And people don't catch that. It's blasphemy. It's going against the Word of God. It's heresy. It's Satanism at its finest. Stay away from these, these so-called movies. Get in the Bible. There's people that are so clueless that, did you know about this? Or you ask them about a story in the Bible, and they start telling you the story that they, they saw in a cartoon or a movie, and they think that's what the Bible says. And you open the Bible and say, hey, no, it says that. They're like, oh, it really does? Yeah, you need to spend more time in this, brother sis Christ. So do I. We all do. This is where I, if I want to learn, the, if I, God puts on my heart, um, Noah the flood, I'll open this and read the story from now on. I won't turn to this. I'm looking at my computer screen. I won't turn to cartoons and stuff like that. That's why I'm, all, I'm against the kid, child, kids' cartoons. I'm 100% against the kids' cartoons. Why? Because they don't line up with the scriptures. I remember putting one on for King David, and... All the, you have Jesse and his uh, seven, six or seven brothers. I forgot how many, if there's seven of them or eight of them. But other than David, Jesse and, the, and his brothers come in. They're all dee -dee -dee, like stupid, retarded people. And they come in from working in the field and they sit there and all the food's before them. And they just, they don't even pray over the food. They just dive in and just start eating the food like animals. And the wife comes in and goes, how dare you? I slaved all day over that food. You guys can at least show a little respect, you know, like you're tasting the food. What if someone important came? And, the, and Jesse just like, looking like a little idiot. And she's, she's like, and they're like, who important would come to see us? She's like, like, Samuel. And she opens the door and there stands Samuel. And I'm like, that's not how it happened at all. What does the Bible say? The Bible says Samuel was walking in the field... And Jesse was in the field, and Jesse saw Samuel coming. And when you see a prophet coming, there was fear. Is he here to proclaim doom? Uh, or good? Bad or good? Bad or good? And Jesse looks at him and says, Cometh thou peacefully? And he says, Peacefully. Samuel says, Peacefully. And that's how it started. And Jesse invites me. What was that? That was feminism. That's that woman Jezebel got a hold of that. And they're indoctrinating the children with that junk. Sorry to go off a little bit too much. But, Brother Says Christ, you want the truth? This is the only place you're going to find it. You'll never find it with Hollywood movies and the cartoons. Even the ones that they make for kids. Well, we're just making it more fun for the kids so they can understand. It's garbage. It's 100% garbage. Keep your kids away from it. Teach them this. You know what I used to do? You know what I used to do? I still have my last, uh, I lost my daughter to the world and I lost my daughter in death. But I still have the last uh, child support payment I put in here. Because uh, I was praying for her while she was still alive. And, Moses Jesus Christ, when, I, when my daughter was young, I would read the stories in the Bible. And we'd go online and we'd look up pictures. We'd look up the ark. Uh, Noah's ark. We'd look up oceans. We'd look up all the different animals that came on the ark. We'd look up the mount when it says it landed on Mount Ariat. We would look up pictures of mountains and being in high places, and so on. Same thing with all the stories. We'd read the story as it is, and we'd look up pictures. Okay. That's something you can do with your child. But this is what I what I read to her. We stayed away from the cartoons and the garbage. Like I said, when she grew up, she chose the world. She chose the world. 
But brothers says Christ, stay away from that junk. I'm sorry to go off on a little bit of a tangent. This is a long study as it is. But stay away from that junk. I can't emphasize it enough. It's 100%. I've searched. I've searched. I even put the challenge out there to the brethren. Show me one video that you've come across that's uh, based off of a movie or a cartoon that lines up exactly with the Word of God. If, if, it, if Moses says something in that cartoon, does it line up with this? That's the thing that gets me. Moses will say something, and then you go to the cartoon, and they'll change it. And the one thing you see in these movies, and then I'm, I'm, I'm going to get off this train. One thing you see in the movies is they'll say, small caption, but they'll say that they believe that this cartoon or this movie is true to the essence of the story. And in fine print it says that we did take some liberties. In other words, they decided to add to and subtract to the Word of God as they saw fit. That's what it's saying. But it's true to the essence of the story. Here's the truth, period. This is what we need to be in, brothers, says Christ. Not that garbage. Not the garbage of the world. Like Hollywood and cartoons. Point three. Okay, that was point two. It was supposed to be a small point, but we ended up making a bigger point. He was a mason, a goldsmith. He wasn't a bricklayer. He wasn't in the mud. That, that Disney movie Moses shows him in the mud. No, that's not him. So I ask you, maybe if brethren can find other places to help back this up. His, his um, skill set, you know, had to do with, uh, mason, uh, I said mason, but that's like stone work. But it could have been stone, gold, metal, you know, making statues and stuff like that. Point three, I'd like, God spoke to Aaron too. As we're getting into this, I want you to know this. When they came to Aaron, Aaron wasn't some just dumb guy on the side of the road that was clueless. Hey, let's pick the dumbest guy ever, and okay, you're in charge. You know those jokes they do in the Hollywood movies and stuff, TV show? They try to joke, you're the dumbest one, okay, you're in charge. That's not the case here. God spoke to Aaron too, more so with Moses. And Moses passed God's word into, unto Aaron, but God did. It shows in the scriptures that God did speak to Aaron. I'm gonna, you don't have to turn here, but Exodus 4, 20, 27. And the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. The Lord said unto Aaron, Exodus 6, 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron. They're both present. He's speaking to both of them. And gave them charge unto the children of Israel and unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Leviticus 3, 1 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, Leviticus 14, 33, And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, Leviticus 15, 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, Both of them. I can keep going. Numbers 2, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, 2, 1, Numbers 4, 1 says it, Numbers 4, 17 says it, Numbers 14, 26 says it, and I stopped. I didn't, it's, it's not, it's not, it doesn't necessarily end there. I just stopped saying I made my point. God spoke to Aaron. Today we pray, but God does not verbally speak to people like he used to in the Old Testament. We have the Holy Spirit. God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit, through his word. We pray, but God doesn't verbally speak to us. Like, uh, I, I, how else should I explain this? He speaks to us, men, uh, men in times past spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Okay, that's there. But I'm talking about the audible sound, like when God's calling from heaven, when God's on the mountain, when God's talking to Moses through the burning bush, the audible sound of God. Aaron got to hear from God. Okay. Point number four. Aaron not only saw the miracles God did, but was used of God in performing them. Exodus 4.30, And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord has spoken unto Moses, and did the signs in the sight of the people. Exodus 7.9, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, say, sh saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. Aaron cast a rod before Pharaoh. Like I said, the cartoons always get it wrong. They show Moses all by himself, and he's doing it all by himself. That's wrong. Aaron was there. Aaron threw the rod before Pharaoh, and it turned into a snake. Exodus 7.19, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying unto Aaron, 
Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, stretch out thy hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood. And that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and vessels of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so, as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river, and the sight of Pharaoh, and the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. The miraculous signs and wonders, Aaron not only saw them, he was used of God in performing them. God did the miracle, don't get me wrong, but he, was, he, had, a more, he had a bigger role than just someone sitting there being a witness and seeing it, is what I'm trying to get at. Once again, the movies and cartoons always show Moses doing all the talking when it wasn't so. Moses talked to Aaron. Aaron talked to Pharaoh. Oh, Moses struck the water. No, Aaron struck the water. Moses gave his staff to Aaron. Aaron struck the water. Or moved over the water and then struck it. Uh, Moses gave the rod to Aaron and Aaron threw it before Pharaoh and it turned to a snake. But the movies, the cartoons always get it wrong. Why? Because it's all about replacing this and straying from this. But the point for this study is he saw it. The equivalent for us today is we're going to bring it to today for, for Instruction Righteous. You have brethren, they get saved, they get born again, they see the power of God in their life. The power of the gospel is the changed life after salvation. That's the power of the gospel and Paul's talking about it. The changed life. The new creature in Christ Jesus. You have that hope. Be, be ready to give the to answer the, the hope that is in you. We're looking for that blessed hope. This isn't it down here. Okay, The power of the gospel. You see the power of the gospel, but what gets in the way of you forgetting all the work that the Lord has done for you? What God did for you on the cross? Salvation? The changed life? How some people go back to resurrecting the old man? They start turning to, they give it into the lust of the flesh, resurrecting the old man. They start getting into the world. They start getting into doctrines of devils and turn from the Word of God. They saw the truth. They know the truth. But what gets them to turn away from it? And that's what we're going to be talking about here, okay? So after all this, what was Aaron's response? I just wanted to get a background, a foundation. This is Aaron. I'm not trying to put him down. This was a man that was used of God. But these people come to him saying, this, uh, this Moses, we don't know what happened to him. Make us gods. Make us gods. What was Aaron's response? Exodus 32, 2. And Aaron said unto them. Wait a second. Where's Aaron trusting God with all his heart and telling the people that Moses is okay? Have faith and be patient. There's that part. Okay. But Aaron said unto them. He's not seeking the Lord. He said, okay, wait, wait right here. Let me ask the Lord. Lord, is Moses okay? Lord, is this okay? He's not seeking the Lord. He's not trusting the Lord with all his heart. He's trying to do it himself. I, mean, I was talking with the brother in Christ. If you remember the story, there was a prophet that had to leave Judah and go into Israel. The other nine tribes. I think it was Jeroboam. He had to go and he had to correct Jeroboam. And he was told of God that the path, is, if you actually look at the map, it's like a U-shape. That bends all the way back around and he comes back to the point where he started. He was told to never backtrack and not go back to Judah the same way he went. He was not to backtrack. He was to keep going, preach the word of God to Jeroboam, come back around, and he's supposed to go back. He, he was never supposed to backtrack and walk the same path twice. That was one of the commands of God. He wasn't to eat food in that place. He wasn't to eat water in that place. And he comes across that other prophet that ran out to meet him and got him to backtrack to come back to his home. Backtrack. Walk the same path twice. And eat food and water. And I was talking with him and the brother in Christ was saying, yeah, but... And I said, where did that prophet say, the one that was supposed to be doing God's work, where did he say, wait a second, let me inquire of God to see if God wants me to go back with you? He didn't. It'll probably be another study we'll get into about, you know... Uh, acknowledging the Lord in all thy ways. But brother says, Christ, where's Aaron going to God? He doesn't. I got this. I can handle it. I got this, God. I got you. I don't need to I don't need to go to God for this. 
Psalms 37, 7 says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. These people were not patient. They were impatient. How many, a lot of brethren that usually watch this know the story of Israel. Maybe you're newly saved and you don't. But as Israel's coming out of Egypt, every time they hit something that seemed like they hit uh, tribulation, when they hit hardship, when things weren't just super easy for them, they would whine, they would complain, they would lose their patience. They'd say, we, rather, we'd, I wish we would have died in Egypt. We'd, we'd be better off going back to Egypt. They would turn on God like that in a heartbeat. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Psalms 41 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. I That prayer request I mentioned, three weeks ago, I prayed, Lord, open a door so I can handle a, hand a gospel tract to someone. And they'll take it. Because lately, when the door, when I think a door's open, I go to offer it, nobody will take one. No one will take one these days. That was three weeks ago. And I've been praying the same prayer for three for longer than three weeks. But I just remember that we I really got into talking with the Lord about it three weeks ago. And it happened yesterday. Be patient. When you pray, be patient. God doesn't always answer right on the spot. Now, I'm one of those, real quick, brothers and sisters, I'm one of those preachers that I believe the Word of God. I'm against the teaching of, thank God for unanswered prayers. There's no such thing. God will always answer prayers with three answers. Yes, no, not right now. But the one thing I do believe is that sometimes God doesn't answer the prayer right on the spot. Sometimes you got to be patient and wait on Him to answer. But He will always answer. He will not leave you hanging. This whole thing about leaving you hanging, thats I don't want to go into it too much, but it has to do with the battle buildings and most of the people are lost. God doesn't hear their prayer. They're trying to hide the fact that God isn't listening to them. King David said, if I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. God doesn't hear the prayers of lost people. And these buildings are filled with lost people. So the prayers aren't getting answered, so what's their solution? Thank God for unanswered prayers. How about you actually get people saved? So then God will answer their prayers and will hear their prayers. Whole another thing, but wait patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Wait patiently. Sometimes we jump the gun and we try to do something without waiting on the Lord. There's a lot of things I keep asking the Lord and saying, Lord, what about this? What about that? Lord, I'd like to do this. I'd like to do that. And sometimes it doesn't happen, and I wait on the Lord and see what he says. Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says flat out no. Sometimes he tells me, that's not what I want for you right now. Not right now. You know, remember we talked about kids, they all go to the father or they always go to the mother. That's the three answers you should be able to get from, from a mother and a father. Yes, no, not right now. We're like ch we're children to God. He's our father. We're, now are we the sons of God? 2 Thessalonians 3, 5, And the Lord directs your hearts into the love of God and into patient waiting for Christ. What's this waiting we're waiting on? Looking for that blessed hope. Today, brethren aren't being patient. They're not waiting and looking for that blessed hope. They're getting distracted by the world. They're looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. They're worried about losing things down here because things down here are just more important than things up there. We're waiting for Christ. Some people are getting impatient. Why isn't he coming back now? He should be coming back. No, we're supposed to be patiently waiting for it with the life that we're living. We're to continue living for Jesus Christ. That's what looking for that blessed hope means. That you're living for Jesus Christ every day. Being a living witness and a verbal witness. Taking God's word and hiding your heart every day and living it. Putting on the whole armor of God every day. Looking for that blessed hope. But some people get impatient for it. Some, some false religions say it already happened. Some people say it won't happen. If it would have happened, it would have happened by now. It's been 2,000 years. If it would have happened, it would have happened by now. You have brethren that turn their back. I understand the Bible doesn't say imminent return, but it says looking present tense. They've turned their back on looking present tense for that blessed hope. They don't believe that Jesus could come back any day now. They, they, oh, he's not coming back for another four or five years. Into patient waiting for Christ. 
Verse 6, Now we commend you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would draw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after traditions which he received of us. Why I go through that whole foundation of Aaron? Aaron, he knows he he God talked to him. He got to take hand. And in in the miracles, God used him to perform the miracles. He listened to Moses. He got to see things. He knows God, God's way to a point. It's very important. And Aaron said unto them, Why didn't Aaron go to God? Why didn't Aaron trust God with all his heart? These guys are getting him to doubt, saying, What happened to this Moses? It's, it's been 40 days. Who knows what happened to this Moses? And now I'm not trying to add to the word of God, but there's all, he could be dead. He could be trapped behind a rock. He could, have taken off, he could have taken off on us and said, I'm done with these people. I'm tired. And he's taken off, retired somewhere on this some tropical island somewhere, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, and Aaron's starting to doubt. We are to be looking for that blessed hope every day with the life that we live. Don't get impatient. Some have lost their faith. Now when Aaron is seeking the Lord, sex acknowledging him in all our ways. Where is Aaron? I'm sorry. Now where is Aaron seeking the Lord and acknowledging him in all his ways when they came to him with that question? Why didn't he turn and say, Lord, even if he thinks he knows, like the brother said, even if you think you know the answer, there's times I still go to, I, it's a habit that you have to form. I need to go to the God. I know the answer. I can give it to you. But first, Lord, help make sure I have the right verses, make sure I have the right answer, make sure I'm doing it in a way that exhorts the brethren, that picks them back up. Help me, O oh Lord. And then here's the answer. It's a good habit to form to always seek the Lord first before you give people answers. Okay, let's get back to Exodus 32, 2. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings. He caved in. He gave them what they wanted which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Now these earrings, people always think, well, they had earrings. No, they are clip-on. They weren't actually piercing the ear. Okay. Of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And of all, and all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them, at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool. He's using a graving tool. Goes back to one of the points that he's got to be a goldsmith. With a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf and said, and, th and they said, here's another important part, and they said, Aaron didn't say it, and they said, those elders that came to him, those people that came to him, and they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. See, Aaron wasn't for what they were doing, but he compromised and caved in and, gave, and, and made the calf for him. But that's not all he did. And when Aaron saw it, he saw what everybody was doing. These, and they said, these be, and remember the people said, these be thy gods. He built an altar before it. So not only did he make the calf, he built the altar that he put before the calf. And Aaron made proclamation. He started getting caught up in everything. He made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Not these be thy gods that brought you out of Israel, Lord. Aaron's still heart is for the Lord. But he's getting caught up in compromise. Verse 6. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and what's that last part there? And they rose up to play. Brothers of Christ, I have a study on this channel called, it has to do with, uh, I have the right to play and ha have fun. And I had these easy believisms attack me. Oh, he says you can't have fun. Chapter and verse, the word fun isn't even in the Bible. And if you look at every time, oh, this is fun, this is fun. There's times that I miss up and I say fun for joy. This is joyful. This is a blessing. This is peaceful. This makes me happy when I do this. Those are good things. But back in the past, the things that were fun to me, fun, fun, was always fleshly. Fun is flesh. Flesh is fun. Now, in the Bible, the only time the word play is used in a positive light 
is when you're playing an instrument. But other times in the Bible, I try to remember names. I, I, the Lord's trying to help me. But you had King David and and you had Saul, uh, King David, and Absalom. A group of Absalom with a captain, and a group of King David's men with a captain, and they went down to this uh, lake or stream or whatever. And both captains were talking across to each other and said, "Let us now go down and play with one another." And what what was that? They went down and fought one another and killed each other. The Bible says they grabbed each man by the hair and thrust him through with a sword. And they all fell there. Be careful with the word play and be careful with the word fun. Be very careful with that. They rose up to play. And what are they doing here? We're going to find out later. They were getting naked. They're getting drunk. They're getting naked and dancing and just having a good old time. We're playing. Now, don't get me wrong, the Bible talks about how children play, but what are children? They're carnal. Okay? They're fleshly. They're just out there playing. And you can see them go crazy if someone takes their toy or if they see a toy that someone else has, like toddlers. That's children, toddlers. Okay? They see a toy that someone else has, they just walk over and take it. They see someone, oh, I like that toy. They don't even think twice. They just walk over and take it. And to them, they're just playing. They're just playing. Be careful about the word play and the word fun. Because today the world takes it and makes it a 100% po positive good thing. No, no, no. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Wait a second. What's going on here? It's going back to what, what we just read there in Exodus 32, 2 all the way through 6. He built it. He, he made a golden calf for him, then he built an altar for him. What's going on here? What's keeping Aaron from trusting the Lord and acknowledging him in all his ways? Exodus 32.1, we're going to go back there. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, The people gathered themselves unto Aaron. He was outnumbered. Now, it doesn't say, he was, I believe he was outnumbered and he was overwhelmed. Now, the, word, the Bible does not say he feared the people. But I believe he, he was outnumbered. Today, when I was lost, it's all about peer pressure. Peer pressure. And you start fearing the world. You start fearing being separate. You start fearing that if they don't get their way, they're just going to take it from me anyway. They're going to hurt me if I don't go along with this. Fear the people. Even after everything Aaron saw God do, and Aaron, even through him, he fell into fearing the people over God. Peer pressure. They want this. They want this. They're coming to him. I got put on the spot. I, I, this is my chance to you know, do something right for the Lord because Moses is not here. I get put in charge. And it's time. They came to me. They could have gone to this other guy, but they came to me. And Well, now they're asking for something I know isn't right. What do I do? He doesn't seek the Lord. He caves in and gives them what they want. I believe he feared the people more than he feared God. And he caved in way too quick. He didn't even buckle a sight. He didn't try to calm him down. He didn't try to say, he just said, give me some earrings. Give me some gold. I'll make you a god. I'll make you a calf. He didn't even hesitate. He caved in way too quickly. The fear of man can get one to fall away quickly. Exodus 9.20 says, He that feareth the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the house. One of the, um, the miracles that were wrought, one of the plagues, was uh, fire was going to come down. And you need to get your servants and your animals in. And he says here, Here he that feared the word of the Lord... Among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the house. Aaron was there. He saw that. Psalms 111.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. The beginning of wisdom, fearing God. The end of wisdom, keeping his commandment. Taking his word and hiding it in your heart and living it. Doing things his way. I believe Aaron feared God. He saw this stuff. He feared God. But in that moment, he started fearing the people more than he feared God. Brother, says Christ, how many times in your life do you fall into that trap? 
you fear God, you're doing your best to live for the Lord, but you have those moments where there's someone in your life that you start to fear more than you fear God. Things of this world, the way the world's going, the government, jobs, wives, husbands, children, family members, friends, you start getting fearful over things down here. And you're more afraid of people down here than you are of the Lord. And you start compromising. You stop acknowledging the Lord in all your ways. You stop trusting Him that God knows what He's doing. Um, Deuteronomy 4.35 Unto thee it was showed that thou mightst know that the Lord, He is God, there is none else beside Him. Aaron saw the wonderful works of the Lord. He actually participated in it. Now, when it comes to fearing the world, another story, you go back to, I, I get their names wrong, Meshach, I would say wrong, Abednego. I remember the last name. Why is it we always remember the last name, Abednego? But the three men that were with Daniel, before they got thrown in the, into the fiery furnace, they told him, we are careful, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter, O king. If God will, will save us, he'll save us. If not, if not, but we will remain faithful to the Lord. We will not bow down and worship the statue. They trusted God. If he'll save us, he'll save us. If not, we're still, we belong to God and we're going to do things God's way. That's how we're supposed to be today, brothers of Christ. Don't let the world try to fear monger you into compromising. Don't let peer pressure, these Babel buildings that go off of church fathers, they go off traditions of men, rudiments of the world, philosophy, they use the statement, remember the, all the excuses you hear the lost world use? A little bit don't hurt. We know when to quit. It all depends on how you look at it. Um, who are you to judge me? We always have done it. That's the one I'm talking about. We always have done it. Who are you to judge me? It all depends on how you look at it. We always have done it. Christians of men do not dictate this. This dictates how we're supposed to live our traditions. That's why Paul says, follow the truth. I'm going through uh, Galatians right now. You're to follow the traditions which we have set, which Paul has set, or God has set through Paul. Be ye followers of us as you have us for an example. This defines how we live, not, not the other way around. The world doesn't define how we live. The Word of God does. Matthew 10, 28 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. One of the ways you can fail to trust the Lord with all your heart and fail to acknowledge him in all thy ways, peer pressure and fearing man, what man can do to you. Oh, I'm going to be kicked out. Brothers and Christ, I have lost fellowship. I've had, I, I've had brethren kick me out of fellowship. I've had my met, mentor kick me to the curb for standing for this book, standing for the Word of God. I've had family members that some don't talk to me, but some they just, they're distant. They're still there, but they're so distant. It's like, you know, are they there? Are they there? They'll still say hello every once in a while, but not like they used to when I was lost. Now that I'm saved and standing for the truth, you lose things. I lost my daughter. It came down to our, do I fear losing my daughter or do I fear displeasing the Lord? And I stood for the Lord and I let my daughter chose the way of the world. I lost my wife to the world. And it came down to I did compromise. I did fear my wife more than I feared God in several situations where I chose to do things I knew was wrong to please her. But in the end, praise God, I had to make a decision. Do I fear God? more than I fear losing my wife. If I have to lose her to stay true to God, then I lose her. If I lose my child to stay true to God, I lose them. If I have to lose my very own life to stay true to God, then I lose my life. If I have to lose my job, if I have to live so dirt poor with just the clothes on my back to stay true to God, is that our attitude? Is that your attitude, brothers and Christ? Is that my attitude? I have to check myself daily that I don't get distracted by peer pressure and worldliness. And I don't start to fear things of this world more than I fear God. 
Right. Now jump down to Exodus 31 because the way we're at the story, they do this. They're going, rising up to play. It goes back up to Moses. God made the, the tablet with the Ten Commandments and he tells Moses, get down. Okay, and that's where we are. He's like, they're, they're in sin. Exodus 32, 21. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did these people unto thee? Aaron, I'm sorry, I, I will skip forward a little bit too much. But you have Moses, he's come, coming down, and God's like, I'm going to destroy these people. And Moses says, please don't, please don't. He's trying to be an intercessory for the people. You know, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. It can't be that bad. It can't be that bad because it says God was angry. Then when Moses comes down, he saw what they were doing naked, dancing around a golden calf, calling it gods. It's one statue, and they're calling it gods, plural. It's multiple gods, you know. One plus one plus one equals one. The pagan trinity. I believe in the Godhead of the King James Bible. God the Father and the person singular of Jesus Christ. There's only one God. Thou believe if there's one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. There's only but one capital G God, the Father. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Moses came down and saw them fornicating. And they were naked. And he throws the tablet at the mount. At the bottom of the mount. And then he turns to Aaron. This is where we are. Exodus 32, 21. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee? Did they torture you? You know, did they grab your child, the wife and child and threaten to kill your wife and child? You know, <laughs> that's not what they say. But it says, What did the people do unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? You couldn't have just gone with it. Come on, Aaron. Did you put up a fight? What did they do to you? Aaron didn't put up a fight. They, had, they didn't have to do much of anything. He caved in real quick without putting up any fight. But remember what we read there, his heart wasn't in it. He just came in to peer pressure. He didn't say that these got, were gods that took you out of Egypt. That's was the people. He said we need to go back to worshiping the Lord. He tried to get him back to worshiping the Lord after he realized his mistake. He's like, we need to get back to worshiping the Lord. Not these false gods. Exodus 32, 22. And Aaron said, Let not thy anger of my Lord wax hot. This is how Aaron responded. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. And we talked about this in the Old Testament. Every time they hit something hard, they'd whine and complain and cause problems. There's times where they were going to kill Moses a couple times. And God intervened. Okay. Mischief, 23. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. And I said unto them, Whatsoever hath any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it to me. Then I cast it in the fire, and there came out this calf. I know many preachers and priests before. Just poof, puff, out come this calf. When did we read he used graving tools? It actually took time to make the calf. It wasn't just popped out of the other thing. But he's just trying, it just popped out. Just popped out. Verse 25. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, they just rose up and play. Play. There's nothing wrong with playing. We can play and have fun. Fun is flesh. Flesh is fun. No, we can do things with our hands, good work with our hands, and we can go for a walk on the beach that's peaceful. It's joyful, it's relaxing, it can make us happy, our spirit happy, not our flesh, our spirit happy. But I had to start cutting out the word fun. Yeah, it was such a fun walk on the beach. No, no, no. I wasn't walking around naked. I wasn't walking around indulging in the flesh, because that's what fun is. When I was lost, when I look back all the times, those video games, boy, they were fun. That movie I watched, that was fun. Oh, we went and and played sports, fighting each other in sports. I was on this side, they were on that side. That was a lot of fun. Now, I'm not saying you can't play basketball with brethren, but I'm talking about the organized sports that get your body all riled up. You're at the edge of your seats. You ever see those people that are at the edge of their seats getting ready to cheer or yell at the TV, you know? But this is supposed to be fun. Flesh is fun, fun is flesh. He made them naked unto their shame. Okay? Now, real quick, another point i got to make here. Hmm, what about the altar? Aaron doesn't mention the altar. 
But remember, when Aaron made that altar, it was about proclaiming it to the Lord. We need to go back to doing sacrifices unto the Lord. He already gave one. He, he tried to satisfy the people and gave them the calf. He compromised. Brother says, Christ, how many times do you do it? I point at myself and I, I fall on my knees before the Lord. When I was newly saved, the first four or five years of my salvation, I could still find time, spots where I uh, failed the Lord and compromised. Every once in a while, I can catch myself compromising now on little things. And the Lord catches me. What about the altar and proclaiming a feast unto the Lord? He started out, he did the wrong thing, he gave him the calf, and he's like, okay, this was wrong. i got to try to get the people back to doing what's right by the Lord. You know how you make a mess? I made a mess. I did something wrong. Okay, i got to try to fix this. i got to try to fix this. If he really wanted to fix it, he would have taken a hammer to that golden statue and ground it to powder and dust and thrown it in the, in the Burke Kaidron. <laughs> if you remember in the Bible, that's what they did. They threw it in the Burke Kaidron. I think it's the name of the, of the brook. But you throw it into the river. If he really wanted to make things right, that's what he should have done. But you see, he tried after he screwed up. Brother, we try after we screw up, but you need to acknowledge the Lord. Hey, I screwed up. Exodus 32, 5. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast unto the Lord. He tried to, to fix his mistake, I believe. To the Lord. Not God's plural, to the Lord. But by then it was too late. You already gave what they wanted. They got what they wanted from you. They weren't coming to him for an altar. They weren't coming to him for a, uh, what does it say here? A feast to the Lord. They came to him to get a false god and they got what they wanted out of him. You know what Satan does? He tries to get you to fail the Lord, brother says Christ. He tries to use fear to get you to stop trusting the Lord and to get you to stop acknowledging him in all your ways. And once he gets you to fall, he's like, I got, I got what I wanted out of him. And some of us try to make it up for it. Uh, you, you sometimes, most times, you just got to come before the Lord broken and fall on your knees and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Lord, I shouldn't have caved in. I shouldn't have compromised. I shouldn't have given in to peer pressure. I have people in my family that I have a hard time dealing with. I'll give you an example. My older brother, when I was a young kid, I followed him around everywhere. We did everything together. Before we came out, when we were dirt poor, we moved out to, from Oklahoma City to uh, Oregon, Oklahoma to Oregon, and then we started having our own friends, and we kind of went our separate ways. But from when we were really little kids, up to 11 years old, I followed him around, and anything he wanted to do, we did. And we got into a lot of trouble. I'm just as guilty as he is, but he was the ringleader. Now that we're older, there's still times where that where he comes to visit that he can talk. He starts talking me into doing things I know I'm not supposed to do. And there's been times where I've caved in. I remember one evening we were sitting there, and I was like, "He knows we don't. There's no alcohol allowed in this house. There's no um, Hollywood movies and TV shows and video games. And we're sitting there and we're talking. We did some trips around, did some things because he came to visit." And we're sitting there, and he starts talking about some of the old kid movies we used to watch and. Man, it wouldn't be bad, and he, he talked me into it, and we ended up watching, I think, two old kids' movies that we used to watch. And afterwards, it's like, Lord, he talked me into it. It's not my fault, and the Lord really had to smack me upside the head. It was my fault. I compromised. I gave in. I started fearing my brother never ever wanting to come visit, which I shouldn't, over fearing God. Very, very few people ever come to visit me anymore. Yeah, I think he's one of the only ones left that ever come and actually visit me. He's lost. He's on his way to hell. He's a professing Christian, but he's so worldly, looks like the world, acts like the world, talks like the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. They that have God heareth God's words. He doesn't. You therefore hear them not because you're not of God. He's not saved. He's not born again. But uh, that, kid, that thing comes back to the kids where I always followed him everywhere. And you start having that fear of losing things. Losing family. Losing friends. Losing your job. Losing things of your life that, you, you're, that you're so used to and you love doing. They could be good things. They could be bad things. That you're, you, know, uh, you know, idolatry. Um, addictions. Lust of the flesh. 
you got to fear God more than you fear this world. Now I believe, real quick, now I believe when it really got out of hand, Aaron backed off and had no part in the nakedness, the flesh party. He tried to do the altar unto the Lord. He backed off and tried to do what was right. Now Aaron was guilty, though, of compromising and failing the Lord. Remember, brothers of Christ, when you fail the Lord, what does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? If a man come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. You need to repent. When you fail the Lord, and you let fear get the better of you, and you start compromising the Lord, and you, it gets in the way of you acknowledging the Lord. It gets in the way of you turning to the Lord, saying, Lord, what do you want? Sometimes we know what the Lord wants, remember? The one mother will go to somebody else, or we won't even, like Aaron, we won't even talk to the Lord. We know what the Lord wants, and that's not what the Lord wants, but that's what these people want. It's what my flesh wants. It's what the world wants. It's what Satan and his ministers want. And they've infiltrated Babel buildings, and now I've got to be like these Babel buildings, and I've got to go with the flow. And you start fearing things down here. Now, I, I, we might get into that verse where it says, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. Aaron failed the Lord, but when you keep reading Exodus 31, 26, then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Remember, Aaron tried to make that altar and say, we're going to do a feast unto the Lord, singular, one God, one God. Okay. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me, and all the sons of Levi gather themselves together unto him. All the sons of Levi? That would include Aaron. He's a son of Levi. That would include Aaron. In the end, Aaron stood with the Lord and got his heart right with him again. Brother Christ, you can too. That's what it's talking about, picking up your cross daily. We drop our cross all the time. I don't think I've gone through a 24-hour period where I haven't thought, dropped the cross here. Where my mind starts wandering for a few minutes, 30 seconds, 10 seconds, on something it shouldn't. And I have to bring, all. the Bible talks about bringing your thoughts into subjection to the obedience of Christ. My imagination starts going off in the wrong direction. And I, God helped me reel it in. There's not one day that I don't drop my cross. That's why it says pick up your cross daily. I, Lord, I'm sorry for those thoughts. Lord, I shouldn't have started wandering. You know what? Let's start playing the Bible. I play the, the Alexander Scorby. I'm going to get up and I'm going to go walk and I'm going to start praying and talking to you about things, Lord. I'm going to get to doing some work with my hands and talk with the Lord as I'm doing some good work with my hands. I get back to what matters. But I have to repent. Then I have to pick up that cross that I dropped. And I get back to living for the Lord. Get back into His Word. Get back into prayer. Get back into doing good things with your hands that please God. Okay. It's never too late, brethren, to get your heart right with the Lord. Aaron did. He got his heart right with the Lord. All right. Another example of fearing man more than God. We're going to keep pushing this. What gets in the way of you trusting the Lord with all your heart? Your own understanding. Fear comes in, and you start relying on your own understanding, and you forget what God has done. God saved me when I didn't deserve it. I still don't deserve it. God saved me. God gave me a new life. He's done all these wonderful things for me. I have all these blessings. There's an old hymn that says, Count thy blessings one by one. See what the Lord has done. When you're down and out, and you just you think everything's falling apart, count your blessings. Why? Because you start looking at the Lord, and you start getting back to the Lord, and saying, you did this for me. You did that for me. You saved me. You gave me a new life. You helped get that sin out of my life. You helped me with this. You helped me when I went through these hard times. You were there with me, Lord. You got me through those hard times. Count your blessings. Okay. Another example of fear of man more than God is John 9.20. If you want to turn to John 9.20. I'm going to try to keep this going because we're almost done. And I don't know how long this study's been, but we're almost done. One more page of notes. But another example of fearing man more than God how many of you guys remember the story where Jesus healed the man that was born blind? He spits on the ground, takes the clay in the clay, mixes it, mashes it together, and puts it on his eyes. And then tells him, go wash in Siloam. I think Siloam. I'm, I'm saying it wrong, but go wash 
off and you will see. So the man never actually got to see who Jesus is because he's blind. He's got the clay on him and he got told to go wash, but he was born blind. And this miracle was done and this man is brought before the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the Levitical priesthood because they want him to denounce Jesus Christ. And they're asking, what did he do? What did he do? What did he do? But here's the part for this study. His parents were brought in and said, is this, is this really your son that was born blind? What was his parents' response? John 9.20 His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. You don't think he went to his parents first and told them? This man, I don't know what he looks like because I was blind, but this man that they called Jesus, he put clay on my eyes and I could see. He told them the story. I believe it. But look how they respond. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or what hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. Why are they saying this? Verse 22. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews for the Jews had already agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, Jesus, Christ the King, the Son of the living God, he should be put out of the synagogue. They feared man over God. That's why they acted like, oh, I, I don't know what he's talking about. Uh, I mean, yes, he's our son, and yes, he's born blind, but uh, I don't know what he's talking about. Ask him. He's of age. Ask him. They feared Man over fearing God. They got feared of getting kicked out of that synagogue. They get fear, you get feared, brother, says Christ, of getting kicked out of the battle buildings. I say get out of them to begin with. They line up more with Rome these days than they ever do with the Word of God. Get out of these battle buildings. Okay, get out of them. Period. Okay. But you can join a group on here and you start fearing getting kicked out of this group. And when this group is going, I've been kicked out of several groups because I've stood for the Word of God. And in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, pleading with them to line up with the Word of God, I've been kicked out of groups. But there's times where I've hesitated big time. Why? Because I didn't want to get kicked out of the group. My mentor, I disagree with, I'll call his name, Brian Denlinger. I disagree with Brian Denlinger on Christmas for a long time. But I kept my mouth shut. Why? Because I was afraid of getting kicked out of that group. I've seen how Brian treats people over, over Christmas. He stabs them in the back and kicks them to the curb like they're nothing over Christmas. I've seen how he treats people, loses his temper over Christmas, a pagan holiday. I saw that and I'm like, I kept my mouth shut for so long. I, I was like Aaron, kept my mouth shut. Just went along and told them what they wanted to hear. God pressed my heart and said, listen, you need to put out, so now that you're doing Bible studies, because I wasn't for a long time, I, when, I, when I disagreed with Brian, I wasn't putting out Bible studies. I just kept my mouth shut in the comment section. Then God said, you need to come out with some Bible studies showing that that's not of God, and you're not pleasing God when, you, when you're doing Christmas. It's pleasing the flesh. It's pleasing the world. It's pleasing the lowercase g gods of this world. And I came out with those videos, and I lost fellowship with Brian Denner. He broke fellowship with me over a pagan holiday. Over this. Brothers, sisters in Christ, you have to be willing to risk it all, no matter what you lose. Daughter, wife, husband, son, mother, father. The Bible says, he that loved mother or father more than me is not worthy of me. He that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You can love your wife. You can love your husband. You, I love my daughter. I love my wife. But I love God more. I love those fellowships. But I love God more. And I'm going to put God first. No matter what the cost, I'm going to put God first. And I'm not going to fear the loss I'm not going to fear what man can do to me. Another situation, John 3.1, if you turn it back to John 3.1, there was a man of the Pharisees. People think, well, Jesus was just mocking the Pharisees with his parables. No, he was trying to reach them with truth. But he used parables because if he called them flat out for their sin and their wickedness, they would have had him stoned right there and it's not his time. He needed to spend so much time preaching truth 
before they crucified him. But you see here, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night, not during the day, at night, and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art the teacher from God, teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. You say, why did he bring this up? He came by night. Why? Because he feared the other Pharisees. He feared getting kicked out of his little group. The fear can get in the way of you acknowledging the Lord in all your ways, doing things God's way. Fear can get in the way of you trusting God. And I know there's so many other verses we can use. Another example of fearing God more than man, here we go, Daniel, this will help us get the words. In Daniel 3.14, if you want to turn to Daniel 3.14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Shadrach, Meshach, you got to keep saying it over and over to get it memorized. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbuck, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music. You know when I, what we heard there, read there about Aaron? When they had this calf, this be your false gods, they started drinking and, and eating and drinking. And they got up to play. They were getting naked, drunk. I have no doubt there's probably music. They started, had, had someone start playing music and they were all singing and to this false god and just such in the flesh. Do we see that today? You look at all these so-called worldly concerts today. What is it? They're worshiping false gods. It's all flesh. You fall down and worship the image which I have made well. If you do it, well. But if ye worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? So we see Aaron, he feared the people. He could have been feared of being thrown out. I think more than anything, he feared for his life. How many times did those people threaten to, th to stone him and Moses? And he lost his courage. He lost trusting in the Lord with all his heart. He gave in to fear. You can have fear where you're going to lose something, but the number one thing that you can lose in the end is your life. Here you have me. Uh, I'm sorry, like I said, hey, Shadrach. Meshach and Abednego, their lives are being threatened. If you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? 16. Shadrach, here it is, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Their lives were on the line. As you keep reading the story, their life was thrown on the line. They were thrown in the fire furnace. Jesus, an early manifestation of Jesus Christ, was protecting them. And God did save them. Okay. But if he didn't, they still weren't going to uh, worship false gods. They weren't going to cave in and give in to fear. They were going to stand by what is true and good. They weren't going to give in. Now, I was going to read about Acts 5, 11 through 29. You can read how the apostles, they're getting arrested, they're getting threatened, and they're getting told that they need to stop preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. They get beaten. Their life is getting threatened. And in the end, Acts 5.29, they say, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. What caused you to start obeying men rather than God? Fear. Compromise. You give a little bit. I'll just make a little calf and throw it out there. And that should, that, that should ease them so they won't kill me. That should you know appease the crowd so they don't, won't kill me. You know one of the biggest ways they appease the crowd today? Food and entertainment. When you read there, he gave them the calf. What did they start doing for the, for the people? 
They were eating and drinking, and they rose up to play. Food and entertainment. And in doing so, they were worshipping a false gods. A golden calf, one statue, and calling it gods, plural. Do we see that today? Here in America, it's all about food and entertainment. Oh, if we lose all, the, lose all our food and entertainment, organized sports, uh, the music industry, the movie industry, the TV industry, now, now we got YouTube, we got Facebook, we've got, oh, is it Twitter, where they can slip through and watch video after video after video of just entertainment, 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 and you got, we got more food than we need. Okay. Food and entertainment, and this country has used food and entertainment to distract Back in the day when there were a lot more Bible-believing Christians when this country was founded, over time they started using food and entertainment to distract the people, and they went through and destroyed this country. They took all the laws that lined up with this and changed them. They took, the first thing they did is they took God out of everything. Then they brought in feminism to destroy the home, the family home, the godly family home to destroy it. They brought in feminism, women's suffrage, feminism. Then they messed up the children. The, the school system, indoctrinating the children, messed up. And what did the people do? They didn't do anything. Why? Because they were distracted by food and entertainment. But it comes down to this. Peter and the apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Brother Jesus Christ, I know in your heart, and I know in my heart, we sit there and we say, We ought to obey God rather than man. But I look back, there was times I compromised. There's times the fear of the, of the world got, got to me. Fear of losing somebody. Fear of losing something. Fear of losing my own life. I'm at the point now where I ought to be God rather than man no matter what I lose. And I've lost a lot, brother says Christ. Don't tell me that you don't understand. You just don't understand. Sometimes it's just too hard. Sometimes the pressure, you just don't understand. I do understand. I've lost a lot. But I've gained so much more. Nothing down here can be compared to what awaits us in heaven. The Bible talks about. We look for that blessed hope with the life we're living. It's not easy, brothers and Christ. It's not easy. I'm getting a little bit quiet. Maybe I need to get louder so that the mic will pick it up. But... Brothers and sisters, it's not easy. I've been there. I've lost a lot. Standing for this book, I've lost a lot. A lot of things that are dear to me. I was sitting out there the other day, and I was daydreaming. My daughter would be 20, 21 now, and I started daydreaming what it would have been like if she was still alive, you know? I start, it's, it's vain imagination. Why? Because she's gone, and I need to deal with that. She's gone. I've lost a lot, brothers and sisters, Christ. I've lost a brother that I love and I still pray for that used to say, I love you, brother. I, I'm praying for you, brother. I'm here for you, brother. I got to know them. They got to know me. They were like the, the Psalms where it says, a friend that's closer than a brother. And I've had them turn on me like ravening wolves. That hurts. But I'm standing for this book. No matter what the cost, I'm standing for this book. Exhortation to the brethren when it comes to God. Psalms 111.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. Brothers Christ, the Bible says that... Uh, when I say, uh, I'm trying to remember scriptures, so forgive me. Um, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Jesus warned us about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, how they love the praise of men over the praise of God. They get stuck on themselves. They like the praise of men over the praise of God. I want the praise of God. I want to please God. The book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher, he goes through and talks about life. You know, there's a time to be born. There's a time to die. There's a time to plant. And then there's a time to pluck up that which is planted. Harvest time. And he goes through and talks about the world, and basically he's saying it's all vanity. If there's no God, and there's nothing to look forward to, 
No God to serve and nothing to look forward to. It's all vanity. Vanity, vanity. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. And you get to the very end of Ecclesiastes and it says, uh, let's hear the sum of the whole matter. I, th I hope I'm getting that part right. But it has to do with, he's basically saying, I'm going to sum up this whole book that I've been preaching, the preacher, okay, Ecclesiastes. I'm going to sum everything up. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all day to keep his commandments. It starts with the fear of the Lord and ends with keeping his commandments. If you're not keeping his commandments, it's because you're not fearing the Lord. When I fail the Lord, and there's a lot of times I fail the Lord miserably in my walk with the Lord being saved in 10 years, especially in my early years as a babe in Christ. When I failed the Lord miserably and fell on my face, it's because I wasn't keeping His commandments. I was doing things the flesh's way or the world's way. I was letting Satan get, come in and get me to, and turn me from this. I wasn't holding that shield of faith that's supposed to protect you from every fiery darts of the wicked. I wasn't putting on the whole armor of God every day. I wasn't being sober, being vigilant. I didn't keep God's commandments, and you look back, I wasn't fearing God. I was fearing something else. They go hand in hand. If you fear God, you're going to keep His commandments. If you're not keeping His commandments, what's getting in the way of you fearing God? What's getting in the way of you acknowledging Him in all your ways? Fear gets in the way. Matthew 10, 28 says, and fear, once again, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body and hell. What keeps people from getting saved today? The sor Remember, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Godly sorrow, sorrow towards God. For what? For all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. For the wages of sin is death. What's that sorrow? You're sorry for sinning against God, and you fear His judgment that's coming. I'm sorry, Lord. I am a sinner. I have sinned. Look at these specific sins. I have sinned against you. You start fearing God. Him that's able to kill, destroy both soul and body in hell. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrows of the world work at death. What keeps people from getting saved? They start fearing losing things that feed the flesh, the lust of the flesh. What? I have to give my life to Jesus Christ? There's a changed life after salvation where God cleans up my life? And I'm set apart from this world. But I love my sin. I don't want to lose my sin. I fear losing my sin. The lust of the flesh. They fear losing things of this world. Idolatry. Wealth. Family. Friends. Wives. Husbands. You mean you want me to get saved? If you're like a, 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 in a Muslim or Jewish. You used to be in the bath. Catholicism right now is trying to make buddy buddy with everyone. We're all friends. But in the past, when they weren't like that, if you left the Catholic Church for the truth, they'd hunt you down and try to burn you at the stake. You, have, you start fearing the world. You start fearing people that can kill your body, but they can't kill your soul. That's in, your soul is in God's hands. There's, gonna, there's a coming judgment for everyone. For everyone. Saved and lost, there's a coming judgment. The Bible says, by the terror of the Lord we persuade men, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For the saved sinners, the body of Christ, we're going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ, and it's not going to be fun. No matter how much I try to look into it, and I try, it's not fun. It's a fearful thing. The great white throne judgment, there's going to be people judged there. A lot of lost people are going to get judged there. There's coming a judgment do you really fear this world or do you fear God? Repent towards God, repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. That's the true plan of salvation for today. And after God saves you, He starts changing your life. 
you got a new life. The old man's dead and buried with Christ. He gives you a new life, and that life is in his son. He starts, you start taking God's word, hiding your heart, living it, and you start being separate from this wicked world, and it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. Life as a Christian in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. That's where I got that verse, 2 Corinthians 5.11. What's this talking about? 2 Corinthians 5.10. You go back a verse. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to what he hath done, whether he, it be good or bad. Brothers and Christ, it's still going to be a fearful thing. I, I want to believe that, you know, John says, if we confess our sins, in 1 John, if we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to believe that if we can get our heart right with God now, and we can get the sin out now, maybe, maybe, it's not something we'll have to face at the judgment seat of Christ. But I can't be 100% on that. When we stand before Jesus Christ, our life as a Christian at the judgment seat of Christ is going to be shown, it's going to be thrown on the fire, everyone will get to see it, and everywhere we failed the Lord might still be shown to everybody. It still might be counted as wood, hay, and stubble that gets burnt up. It's a fearful thing. We're supposed to fear God. This is done for exhortation, brother, to get you to stop and think, brothers and sisters Christ, am I living for God? Am I trusting Him with all my heart? Or is my own understanding getting in the way? Am I acknowledging Him in all my ways? Acknowledging Him in all my ways. So that He can direct my path, that I'm living a life that pleases God. Or am I letting something get in the way? One of the things that can get in the way for this study is fear. When it comes to the world, 2 Timothy 1.7, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. 1 John 4.4, 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. What do we have to fear? We have God to fear. You know, they always say that uh, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. No, God, we have God to fear. But when it comes to this wicked world, what do we have to fear? Nothing. We fear God. God will take care of us. If I have to die for Jesus Christ, I have to die for Jesus Christ. If I have to suffer for Jesus Christ, I'll suffer for Jesus Christ. I've had brethren that have forgotten in ministry, they'll get so bent out of shape when people make fun of them, mock them, say bad things about them, bear false witness about them, and, you know, attack them in ministry, and they get so bent out of shape, and they get so angry and so bitter and so hateful, they forget to praise God to be counted worthy to suffer for His namesake, for His word, for the gospel. They don't give God glory to, and thank Him for being counted worthy to be suffering for Him. They start taking it personally. They start to lose focus. They're not looking for Jesus Christ. They're starting to look at the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you that, ye, that in me ye might have peace. In me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Are you saved and born again? You say, well, yes, brother. I've, I've repented and believed in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessed, open prayer, asked God to save me, and God has given me a new life. I struggle. I slip and fall sometimes. I fail the Lord, but I'm striving to live for the Lord. Then remember that He's the number one person you're supposed to fear, and He is not helpless. He has overcome the world, the power of the gospel. He's the one in charge. Everything that we see going on in this world, don't fear it. They're trying to think, oh, so we have a, if we have a civil war, I talk to the Lord all the time, said if a civil war is what's going to wake people up and allow us to get a few more people saved before we get caught home, then let the civil war come. I don't want to go through a civil war, but if God, if that's what's going to glorify you and help us to wake up the eyes of the brethren to get them to get back on the right path, if it's going to wake up these false converts and get some of them saved, if it's going to lead some of the people that flat out reject you 
lead them to Christ, if it gets them to a broken point because we're going through such hard times, for your glory, Lord, let it happen. Let it happen. They're talking about World War III. Lord, it can't happen without your permission. And if you let it happen, it's for your glory. If we have to go through hard times, a, a worldwide economic collapse. What's going, over on, going on over in Israel with Hamas? And the area over there that they try to say is a Palestinian state when it's not. You start looking at what's going on in the world and we start looking at it in the wrong way. We start looking at it and start getting fearful. Well, I need to start prepping. I need to start prepping and I need to start stocking up and, and I don't rely on the government and I don't do this and blah, 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 blah. We're looking at it the wrong way. We're not looking at it through this. Lord, whatever it takes to get people saved, that's why we're here. To be a living witness and a verbal witness. And no matter what happens in this world, I'm not going to fear what's going to go on in this world. I fear you, Lord. I need to remain, I need to be, remain steadfast. I, don't, I need to not faint. Don't falter. Don't faint. Don't falter. Having done all to stand, I need to stand. continue standing for what is right no matter what happens in this world. Don't start falling in the trap of fearing the world because when you start feeling the world, you start doing things the world's way and you stop doing things God's way. You stop trusting Him. You stop acknowledging Him in all thy ways. When fear sets in, we fail to trust the Lord and acknowledge Him in all our ways like Aaron did. Like those parents did of the man that was born blind. Romans 12, 2, and be not conformed to this world. What does fear do? It gets you to conform to this world. But if you fear God, be not conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It goes back to that verse. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. When you speak, brother says Christ, most of the world ain't going to listen because they're not going to like what you have to say. They don't want to live the way we live, godly, holy, the right way. They want the world's way. And over the years, they've compromised, these Babel buildings have compromised, compromised, compromised to get along and go along with the lost world, to get the lost world to come in so we can preach the gospel to them. You're supposed to go out and preach the gospel. You're not supposed to invite lost people into your fellowship. John 4, 4, 1 John 4, 4 says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. In these last days, brothers and Christ, the more you stay in this book, the more you read this book, the more you're going to see the divide between truly saved and false converts. The more you're going to see the divide between brethren, all brethren, the brethren that are still standing, and the brethren that are falling flat on their face, the falling away. Okay, so you got false converts versus saved. Then you have every all. We're talking about all saved. You're going to have saved that are falling flat on their face, compromising, going the way of the world, giving into fear, giving into all the other things we talked about. <clears throat> And they're not following Christ. And then you have those that are still fearing God and doing things God's way, and they're in a standing position. Now, brothers of Christ, which one are you? We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Back to Proverbs 3, 5. Start with Proverbs 3, 5. We're ending with 3, 5 and 6. Trust the Lord with all thine heart. Brother says Christ, no matter what's going on out here, no matter what the cost is, no matter what the peer pressure is, no matter what they say to you, you know, Moses, he came up to Aaron, what did they do to you that you would do such a thing? He thought they, they, they tortured him, they beat him half to death or something, and Aaron's just standing there. Don't be like that. Don't make the mistake that Aaron made. If you have, do what Aaron did. Those that are on the Lord's side, stand with me. Get back to standing for the Lord. Get back to doing what's right. You compromise, I've compromised. Get back to doing what's right. Trust the Lord with all thy heart. 
and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Not the civil war that might happen in the U.S. Not the civil war or the, the out in Europe right now. They're having riots and stuff. Not what's going on over in Europe. Not the, uh, the gold and silver and the money, the dollar. BRICS is destroying the gold and silver. Not the dollar. Acknowledge him. Not the money down here. Not the economic collapse that might happen. Acknowledge him. Through all of this, we need to be acknowledging Him, not the world. The World War III that might happen. This that might happen. Brothers and Christ, the mission doesn't change. No matter what's going on in the world, we're to live a life of Christ. We're supposed to be a living witness and a verbal witness. We're supposed to be putting on the whole armor of God. We're supposed to be staying in this book daily and praying over this book and praying over the brethren and praying for the lost world when it comes to I always pray that God gives them every opportunity to get saved that God will break them that God will send someone in their life that they will listen to because I've come across people in my life that won't listen to me I've got brethren that won't listen to me no matter what is going on it doesn't change this book right here this book has the world's number. The world doesn't change this book. Trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct our path. And he does. He shows us what's right and what's wrong. Brother says Christ, get back on the right path if you've fallen. Get back up if you've fallen. If you've lost your way, get back to doing things God's way. Get back to praying every day on all day. Get back to acknowledging Him in all your ways. Get back to reading the Word of God. Get back to sanctification, getting wicked stuff out of your life. Get back to fellow, real fellowship and loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. One of the biggest falling away today, I see that you're not loving one another. There's a lot of hate among the brethren. I'm not talking about false brethren. I'm talking about brethren. There's brethren that are in a falling state, and there's brethren that are standing, and you have brethren that are standing aren't trying their best to get the brethren back up. They're mocking them. They're name-calling them. They're, 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 they're like, almost like they're happy that they're in a fallen state. No, we're supposed to be sorrowful, and we're supposed to preach the truth to the brethren that are in a fallen state to get them back up to a standing position. And the brethren that are in a fallen state, they're showing a lot of hate and disdain for the brethren that are in a standing position. And there's a lot of fighting among brethren. False brethren come in and start it. Absolutely, get the false brethren out. And we need to stop, start loving one another and being there for one another. I'm not saying we ain't going to go through some hard times. Like I said before, if God says, let's do it, let's do it. If I lose the house, have to live out of the truck, live on the streets, so be it. For God's glory. I'm not saying I, I'm looking forward to it and I want to. But we need to remember, we're supposed to love one another. No matter what happens, we need to be there for one for another. No matter what happens. Trust the Lord with all thine heart. I'll say it again. Trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He will direct thy paths. We're going to end this, brothers and sisters Christ, with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, there's an email to the ministry if you ever have any questions or want to talk. You can leave comments underneath the channel. I know a lot of brethren don't because... They're, they're fearful of, of the different groups, and they're fearful that they might get kicked out of their group, or, you know, they're, you know, get, you know, whatever. But, Brothers Christ, I'm here. If you need something, contact me. My biggest thing I'm doing lately is Bibles. Okay? My love for you, which is in Christ Jesus, the Lord, I'm here for you, Brothers Jesus Christ, and I'm praying for you. Please keep praying for me. Please keep praying for my usefulness in the ministry. Pray for men in ministry that they're not the ones that have fallen get back up on their feet. I pray for them all the time. Some of you know the ones I pray for. All right, I don't hate them. I want them to get back on their feet. Pray for the ones that are in a standing position that they remain in a standing position. Brother says Christ, my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Thank you for bearing with me for this study, and I will see you in the next study.